Hi, I'm Raymond Chandler, and this is Emily Deering, and we are Parallel Games. Uh, we're here in Columbus, Ohio at Tabletop Game Cafe uh, to tell you about our upcoming Kickstarter campaign. It plays two to four players in about two and a half hours. It is a heavy Euro resource management worker placement game with an 18xx style stock market mechanic to it. So we're just going to dive right in and kind of teach you the game, how to play it. We're going to play a couple rounds. We also have Joe from the Deep End Podcast here today and from Panda. So let's just go ahead and, and teach and run through it. Sounds yeah. good, guys? Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So you play the game over f five rounds. Uh, each, each round we call a decade, and each decade is made up of five different phases. The first phase here is a stock phase where you're going to buy and sell different shares in companies. Now, at the start of the game, we're all going to choose a company we want to start with. Um, and if you're familiar with 18xx style stock markets, you know that each company, and we have tons of companies up here, so let's go ahead and grab one. So we have Anglo-American here. Anglo-American doesn't have any value to it, right? They're, all it has is some pieces of paper. And uh, if you want to start Anglo-American, you're going to choose to, to, to invest in that company in order to start it. There are 10 shares in each company. There is a 30% director certificate, a 20% preferred certificate, and five 10% certificates to make up a total of 100% of the company. Now, in order to start this company, you have to buy the director certificate. Um, the, the, the trick here, though, is that you get to decide uh, how much money to put into it because you can start a company anywhere in this grade in area. Um, so, for example, if I bought the 30% director certificate and I put that in front of me, I would take $105, and we're playing with poker chips today, like uh, true XXers. I would take $105 and I would put that into the company. Um, and now I own the 30% director certificate, and the remaining 70% is still in the company. Now, Joe later on his turn uh, in the future, in a future stock round, could buy this 20% by paying uh, $35 twice. So. When you start the company, you decide what the company is worth, right? So I'm deciding that this company is worth $35 a share, which is why $105 went into the company. So $35 three times, $105 goes in the company. Joe later on could buy the 20%, and if he buys the 20%, he would put $70 into the company. Um, if Emily here decides to buy a 10%, she puts another $35 into the company. Then in future phases, the company is going to use its money to perform actions. So your money as a player is basically used to buy and sell shares. And the company's money is going to be used on the company's turns to take actions of do things on the board and to uh, uh, buy resources and kind of produce goods and sell them to, to market demand so that it makes money. Now here's the other trick. When it makes money, uh, let's say it makes $100, uh, it can choose either to withhold all of that money, in which case it would take $100 from the bank and it would go into here, or it can choose to pay out to its shareholders. Well, Joe's a shareholder, Emily's a shareholder, and I'm a shareholder. So I would get uh, $100 divided by 10 times 3, because I have three shares, right? Um, there's a lot of math. Don't let that intimidate you. It's actually not that difficult. I'm terrible at math, and it's pretty easy. It's all, <laughs> everything is evenly divisible by 10. So if I run for 100 divided by 10, that's $10 a share. I have three shares, so I get $30. Emily has one share, so she gets $10. Joe has two shares, so he gets $20. So that, that's the overall gist. And then because we get paid as players, we have more money to invest in more companies. And we're going to keep doing that over the course of the game. So the first round, we're going to, uh, the first phase of each decade, we're buying and selling shares. Um, on, on those phases, we can choose to pass, and if you pass, you're not out, right? You can continue to take actions um, because you're going to have a chance to come back to it. And the reason you might want to do that is because you want to see what Joe's going to do. If, is Joe going to start another company? Maybe I want to invest in his company rather than buying something else. Great idea. Yeah? <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's cause, always, cause, bet, always bet on Joe. Always bet on Joe. That's a that, lie. So uh, that's the stock phase. We're going to buy and sell, sell stock. Uh, we have a building phase. So at the start of the game, uh, each one of us are going to get three building tiles. And this is, these are kind of what the buildings look like here. I'll just go ahead and pull some of these out. Uh, we're going to get three building tiles. We're going to choose one that we're going to play face down into our player area. So uh, I am uh, the green player, and this is completely unrelated to Anglo. Like Anglo is the green company, but I'm the green player, 
because I have the green player aid and I have the green player uh, partners. And I'm going to choose one of these buildings that I want to play. I'm going to play it face down into my, um, into my area. And then Joe will place a building and Emily will place a building and we'll flip them all up. Um, depending on what buildings we turn face up, that's going to tell us how many workers to put down on the board. So if I play this building and um, Emily plays this building and Joe plays this building, we're going to get four workers. Four, four new workers are going to come out onto the board. Uh, and then of, of the three buildings that you have, you're going to choose one that you're going to discard and you're going to choose one to keep and you're going to choose uh, one to play, right? So you have three. So in the future round, you're going to get two more buildings um, and then you'll have three buildings to choose from. So each round you have three buildings to choose from that you want to play down. Now, buildings are important because these are action spaces. So you're going to get, get to choose, as you're playing the game, what action spaces you want on the board and what action spaces you don't want on the board. Um, you're going to think around, um, I think this is going to be really popular. I think Emily really needs this for her company. So maybe I place that building down instead of this other building because it's going to pay me a lot of money. The next phase is the action phase. So in the action phase, we're going to take actions in a, in a set variable turn order. I'm going to put out my player partners and I'm going to take actions on behalf of my company. I'm not taking actions on behalf of myself, I'm taking actions on behalf of my company. So for example, I might go here and perform this action. And this action says this company is going to pay the player who owns the building $10 and then it's going to get to use that building, whatever that building does. Or maybe I use this building. In this case, this building says the bank pays the player owns the building $20 and then the company gets to perform an action down here at a $10 discount. This one says the, player, uh, uh, the company pays the player owns the building again $10. So in this case, green is using red's building. My company will pay the red player $10 to use that building. And then there are actions uh, owned by the bank. So. For example, this action here lets you hire workers into, uh, into your company. I'll go over why that's important a little, in a little bit. Uh, this will let you jump and take start player. Um, it will also affect the turn order of, uh, of the company during its operating phase, which is the next phase we'll go over. And then uh, this will let you hire managers, which will uh, improve your company in certain ways, and salespeople, which will also improve your company in certain ways. And then this building here allows you to buy capital assets. So let's go over uh, what some of these buildings do real quick in a little bit more detail. So you'll notice on your company charter, if I place this out here like this, um, this company is going to start with some amount of starting appeal. Now appeal is important. In this case it starts with two appeals. So I'm going to go ahead and put Anglo's appeal marker on the two space on the appeal track. Um, and it's going to sell goods along the pig track because Anglo-American Provision Company was a meat packing company and so it's going to sell goods along this row when it produces them. Now Anglo has two factories. It has a factory here and a factory here. Um, this factory requires one worker in order for it to operate and produce goods and it needs a black and a pink cube which represents coal and livestock respectively. When this factory produces it's going to produce two goods. When you start your company, um, you're going to have these automation tokens on your company. And as you hire workers, you're going to have workers in here. Uh, later on, you may automate one of your workers. Uh, when you do, when, you're, when your factory is fully automated, it's going to produce more goods for you. So rather than this, this worker and these two goods producing two, or I'm sorry, these two resources producing two goods, they produce three goods instead. It's efficient. It's efficient. Um, other thing that you can do is you can hire salespeople. So when this company produces three goods, um, it will go ahead and take three uh, goods from the bank, which then it might want to sell out on, on the demand track later on. Um, if it has a salesperson, its goods are going to sell for more. Normally, uh, they, each one of these goods is worth $30 if the company sells them. But if I hire a salesperson here, they'll be worth $40. If I have two salespersons, it's real hard to see um, on the camera, and I apologize, but in this company, they're worth $50 if you have two salespeople here, which is why you might take the salesperson action. Some companies can uh, hire capital assets, variable player powers, into their company. The way they do that is they take one of these spaces, and this is also a, a special space uh, that gives you a discount to buy these. Um, they all do various things, um, but for example, this company may want to buy Pennsylvania uh, coal. And the reason it may want to do that is because it requires a lot of coal. 
Um, so if it was to buy one of these, it would uh, you would use this action space here, and then you would take that, you'd pay 50 bucks to the bank, uh, and then you would gain this, this, uh, this capital asset. Now, capital assets have both a short-term and a long-term ability. The short-term ability on this capital asset is to automate a worker. Anytime you see a gear, that means automate a worker, which we talked a little bit about uh, briefly, but all you do is you replace one of your workers with an automation token, and then you move your worker over. Um, if you do that again, like, you know, I have no more need for this worker, he gets fired and goes back to the job market. Uh, capital assets also have a long-term ability. For example, um, my company can pay the bank $10 here, and if I tap this, I'll get two coal, and I'll take them out of Haymarket Square here. So this is where you go and get resources. You can also purchase resources here on the operating phase, uh, which we'll go over in a little bit. Um, so now this company has two coal. Some companies, um, you will notice, do not have space for capital assets. So this company, one of its drawbacks, because it has some very good production that's very valuable, is it actually cannot have capital assets. Um, it can purchase them for the one-time ability, but it has to discard them. It can't keep them for their long-term abilities. Um, and so every company is a little bit different in this game. Uh, some uh, companies have major drawbacks in one area, where other companies have uh, some benefit that counteracts that drawback. What managers do is they will uh, improve your production output or your efficiency for each of your factories. Um, so this, if I hire a manager here, after this factory produces, I would be able to take a resource of my choice out of Haymarket Square, and then this company would improve one on the appeal track. Um, so the appeal track is going to uh, track turn order for the operating phase in the game. Um, also, as you move up this appeal track, it will give you various bo bonuses. For example, this bonus here allows me to gain a worker. Well, since I fully automated my factory, I don't really want that worker. Um, so one of the things you can do anytime in the game when you gain an appeal bonus, you can forfeit it to take $25 into the company treasury instead. So I would just take $25 bucks from the bank and put it onto the company. During the operating phase, we're going to operate from the highest on the appeal track to the lowest on the appeal track. Um, right now, there's only one company because, you know, we're in an explanation. Um, but uh, this company, when it operates, the very first thing you do on your operating turn um, is you're going to have an option to buy these resources up here. So every resource in this space is $10. Every resource in this space is $20. Every resource in this space is $30. And the resources in this space are you can't purchase yet. They just kind of show you what's coming. Um, so this company, uh, in order for me to operate and to produce goods, I need at least a pink resource. So I'm going to go ahead and buy this pink resource for $10. And now that I have the resources in order to produce in this factory, I'm going to go ahead and turn these into Haymarket Square. And then I will get three resource tokens. I get two okay. for that one, one for that one. And then I'm choosing not to operate this factory because I don't have enough money in it to buy the resources required, but I do have three resources here. Now, if I had a manager at this point, the manager would trigger uh, before I operate the next factory, but I don't have a manager, so it's not going to trigger. Uh, then I will sell these three goods. So they are going to sell along the pig track here, uh, the meatpacking track. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and put out these three goods here on the demand track. Um, and these goods sell for $30 a piece. So I have one, two, three goods. Um, that's 30, 60, 90. Plus, because I completely filled this card here, I get a $50 bonus. So I run for 140. So what I will do now is I will announce to the table, I run for $140 or $14 a share. Remember at the, at the beginning we talked about everything's evenly divisible by 10. Uh, since there are 10 shares and I ran for a total of 140, I'm going to say I pay out $14 a share. So at that point, everybody's going to get their money from the bank. Um, so, uh, you know, I will take 14 times 3. Emily will take 14 times 1. And Joe over here, who bought 20% share, he will take 14 times 2. Which is 28, because math is easy. Math, <laughs> math is very easy. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not too terribly great at math. I'm sure at some point as we go through the playthrough, I will, I will break out the calculator, but it's not too bad. Yes, and I mean, as everybody that plays an 18xx game knows, we say it's easy, but the very first number that someone sells for is 17. It's right. always 17. <laughs> right, right, time. right. It's always 17. And you know how easy those 17 times tables are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Um, so uh, we will take that money, and then whatever uh, shares are left in the company, the company will get the money for those shares. Um, and then, because this company paid out, it's going to improve in its stock price. Now, uh, one of our handy-dandy stretch goals uh, is going to be this handy-dandy stock bump guide, uh, which makes the math about how you move up on the stock track a little bit easier to calculate. Um, so the general rule is, if you pay out at least your share price, you'll move up one space. So in this case, I paid out $140. That's more than $35, so it's going to move up at least once. If I pay out at least twice my share price, I'll move up twice. So I paid out 70, or I paid out 140. Well, I need 70 to move up twice, so I move up twice instead. Um, and then if you pay out at least three times your share price, you actually triple jump. You go three spaces. But um, there's this little line here. If you're not valued very much, uh, it's hard for your value to increase, right? The rich get a little bit richer. Um, so you have to be ahead of this line in order to triple jump. So you have to be at least at 60 bucks um, a share and pay out a total of 180 or more, and then you would triple jump. If you're at 120, you've got to pay out at least $360, uh, which towards the end of the game is not that hard to do if you're, if you're having a pretty good game. So the stock bump guide that we give you makes that a little bit easier. So you can just say, well, you know, we're at, uh, you know, $35. If I pay at least 70, I get to go up twice. All right. So after uh, the operating phase takes place, we do a little bit of cleanup. Uh, the first thing that will happen is this uh, uh, capital asset will get dumped, will get thrown away. Uh, everything in this space goes to Haymarket Square. We shift things down and we draw some number of cubes from the back, which is always listed underneath the decade. Uh, marker on the decade track to tell you how many cubes to take from our handy dandy resource bag. Um, and then uh, all the demand cards that are filled or have this X on it uh, will, will get removed from the game and we'll shift all the demand cards over. Um, so that's the general gist of the game. Luckily, uh, all three of us, I think, have played before. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it should go pretty quick as we do the first couple rounds to show you how everything's working. And we'll kind of narrate for you what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll, let's just go ahead and get started and play. Let's Absolutely. have some fun. Awesome.